This week on Quality Digest Live, we bring you a special episode of looking at the U.S.-China relationship from a quality perspective. That's right, and uh, Dirk and I, along with uh, Quality Digest CEO Jeff Dewar, recently had an in-depth conversation on the topic, and we're gonna take a closer look at that when we come back. Back to Quality Digest Live for June 1st, 2018. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dr. Sharm, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. He is indeed, and I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richmond. Well, you know, if you've checked out our site this week, uh, or you checked out our newsletter as well, you've no doubt seen that we've been taking a really deep dive into the relationship between the two biggest economies on Earth, those belonging to the United States and the one belonging to China. The series is the first under our new Quality Digest Reports banner, which we hope to bring you regularly going forward. Uh, it included uh, feature-length articles from our CEO, Jeff Dewar, Dirk right here, yep. myself, along with Laurel Tennis and Ryan Day on the QD team, and a couple of other relevant contributions from others outside of our team. Uh, and yeah, we had a really fun time writing. I think we were just talking about that today. Yeah. It really was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a great. challenge, yeah. it was fun, we learned a lot. We hopefully we shared some information with you. Uh, from the looks of it, a lot of you are reading it. We're getting good traffic on the, on the series. Um, so recently, Dirk and I sat down with Jeff to chat at length about our respective articles and the larger implications of quality, trade, culture, history, all that good stuff between these two enduring global superpowers. So let's have a listen at this discussion that we had. So Noah, go ahead and play that round table. Hi everybody, I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. I'm joined today by our CEO, Jeff Dewar, and our editor-in-chief, Dirk Ducharme. And hey we're gonna tell you about an interesting little special report that we have for you all uh, about the US-China relationship. A lot of complexities of that relationship. Uh, historical, social, economic, of course, trade, a lot of stuff involved in this one. So we have a multi-part series for you that we want you to read and check out. And this little round table today is really to give you an idea of what the topics are that we're discussing. And we're gonna start with Jeff. Now, Jeff, you were up in uh, in Seattle, where you're located, of course. Right in your backyard was the, the latest ASQ World Conference, where they had a Chinese delegation there. So you had an opportunity in your article to talk about, report from that conference and, and what you learned there. So what did you learn there? Well, it was pretty cool. The uh, it was framed as the first annual quality summit, and in, in the title of this was the Sino-U.S. Quality Summit, and they it was a basically a one day April thirtieth, two thousand eighteen um, gathering of about a hundred people, um, several very very high level Chinese executives, for example the. Um, uh, chairman and president of Jamin Airlines was there, several other chairmen, vice presidents were about the lowest that we actually saw there. Um, along with uh, Google and Boeing and a number of other folks in the, in the uh, from the American side. And what they're trying to do is each year they want to put on this global summit that is, involves different industries, different sectors, different nations. So they chose China because obviously it's quite in the news. And it was an interesting thing because what we had going on was uh, the trade delegation from the Trump administration led by Steve Mnuchin was over in China uh, during the same time that the Chinese were over here for this quality summit. So uh, there was definitely some crossover and there definitely was a buzz in the room uh, in terms of some of the questions that were asked and the way the, the Chinese presented things. And so what we basically saw was um, the Chinese presenting a lot of their ideas about quality, what they've learned from the West, what they've learned from China, uh, from Japan, and uh, you know, really kind of showing specific to their particular company what uh, their view of quality was. Now, the, the one remarkable thing that we heard uh, several times during the day 
was they liked this Silicon Valley style of uh, quality improvement, very rapid innovation, um, improve on, you know, you know, make, find out what's wrong, what doesn't really work for the customers, make very rapid uh, improvements to it, as opposed to, you know, designing in quality from the very beginning and, and, uh, and mistake proofing everything and design proofing everything in a much more long drawn out process. So, and so I, Jeff, I found that sort of the, the high point of the day in terms of the philosophical point that they were coming across with regard to quality. So, so Jeff, I mean, you just said something kind of interesting there. Are you saying they're, they're not showing an interest in designing in quality or, or designing for quality that they're more at the further down the road from that? No, that's still very much part of it, but they put a, a what I would consider a disproportionate emphasis on this uh, this sort of uh, Silicon Valley style of quality improvement. Um, so I don't think they were in any way discarding the tried and true techniques of quality management. Uh, they were trying to take it to the next step and say, you know, is there something that maybe we can do to increase the effectiveness? of how we approach quality built on these, you know, tried and true principles. And, and from my research, it seemed like a lot of the larger Chinese companies are borrowing from the West in terms of, or, or are working with Western companies in terms of learning various types of quality techniques, you know, whether it's lean or Toyota production system or that sort of thing that they're, they're in a sense, they're, the same things going on with them as what went on with Japan, except it's not, it's not personality driven. It's not a Deming or a Duran or a, you know, Taichi Ono. It's, you know, Ford comes in and says, hey, here's what we're doing. Or, you know, uh, uh, you know Qualcomm comes in and says, hey, here's what we're doing. Is, is that kind of your feeling of what, how quality yeah. is progressing? Uh Absolutely. You know, the words damning, uh, interesting, Crosby came up uh, as a name. Mm. Uh, and I didn't hear Duran during the day, um, but certainly Deming was referenced quite a bit. Toyota production system was mentioned, the uh, Japanese tech. They, it was interesting, instead of putting labels of it with regard to gurus or labels of uh, particular kinds of programs, they, they sort of nationalized it in the sense they referred to the American way, the Western way, the Japanese way. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but that all makes sense to me. You know, it doesn't seem in any way um, that they're losing the teachings of Deming, uh, you know, by really looking at it in that way. That was right for the era he came over. It taught a lot of stuff that had been going on in the United States. You know, when I listened to Deming talk, you know, people weren't listening to him in the States, but they, he found a very enthusiastic audience in Japan. You know, he's known as the father of modern productivity in Japan, uh, the Deming Prize, so on and so forth. We don't really see that so much in the way that the, the Chinese were talking, but that might just be because we're now in a different era. But one thing that jumped out at me when I was reading your piece, Jeff, was that there kind of was this lurking cult of personality that was hanging over a lot of the, the addresses from the Chinese delegation. Yes. That was their President Xi. Yeah, President Xi was uh, referenced. Um, I, you know, I tried to actually count it up when I was writing uh, the piece. It mu I must have heard his name 25 times during the day, at least, you know, from all the different presenters. Um, you know, in a very reverential way, in a, you know, you know, this is what President Xi has said we need to focus on. President Xi has indicated this is the first priority, so on and so forth. Um, so, and and I've made the remark in my piece that this is not something that you would have heard from American speakers, American executives, um, by our political leaders. You know, my father was one of the, uh, he was on the first initial team of examiners for the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award back in 1989. And um, President Reagan uh, oversaw many of the ceremonies. In fact, in the article, I actually have a photograph of the one of the kickoff ceremonies with Reagan speaking. And, 
you know, it was it was never something that, you know, President Reagan said this and President Reagan has made a quality of priority and this is a strategic initiative. You know, this was not you wouldn't have seen the kind of, you know, frequency of quotations of the president or any political leader since him by uh, by the Americans. So there's clearly a very nationalistic sense that is um, surrounding this on the part of the Chinese. Well, well quality is basically being, being mandated. I mean, I, I mean, essentially, I mean, China is trying to rebrand the whole made in China. I mean, they don't like the idea that made in China in the past has meant, you know, shoddy, it's gonna fall apart, it's gonna explode, it, you know, it's gonna kill you or whatever. Mm -hmm. They are really making a concerted effort to change that whole that whole idea so that made in China is like, hey, that's a positive thing. It's made in China? Wow, that's awesome. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that, Derek, because it really is, and I want to pivot here to you because your piece talked about this very explicitly, this idea that made in Japan, there was a time when was considered to be Yeah, it was a cheap trans ter terrible. transistor writer. Yeah, exactly. But th yeah. things yeah. do change. And, yeah. and really, your piece was very much down the fairway quality. You know, Jeff and I talked a lot in our respective articles about the background and the history of these things and why we came to where we are. You very much dealt with the, the quality of Chinese, where the quality of the Chinese manufacturing has come from and where it is now. So how did you come up with that angle? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's funny, they all tie together because if you look at um, the historical background, particularly, particularly once you get to Mao and the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. you'll see how that ties into, and then of course we open up trade later on, just shortly after that, um, when you look at the effect, particularly of the Cultural Revolution, what it had on obviously the populace, which just kind of, I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating too much, basically drove them into the ground. Yep. <laughs> I mean, and so now they're coming out of this, they're trying to join uh, free trade, essentially, and now you've got all this cheap labor, and now you've got a little bit of money coming in, and now these people, the, the workers, the, the people who are making these cheap products, you've got this situation where the, 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 the growth of the company, of the country in terms of manufacturing, <clears throat> far outgrew the capabilities, the quality capabilities, let's say, of the people who are making those parts. And at the same time, you have a, pe a group of people making stuff that have, they're making things that they've never even owned before. They're making toys when, as uh, Stanley Chow, author of uh, Selling to China wrote, you've got these, these people right out of the Mao, <laughs> the Mao uh, era, the Mao generation, the Cultural Revolution, they're making things that they never had in the past. And if there's a quality issue with it, they literally are going, why are you complaining about the paint on this toy? I didn't even have a toy when I was a child. <laughs> and and not, out of, not out of meanness or anything, but literally not knowing, what, what are you talking about the paint? Mm. What, what, what's the issue with the paint? I don't understand what you're talking about. There's something wrong with the paint. It looks painted to me. Yeah. And my gosh, I never even had one of these things, right? <laughs> what are you complaining about? What are you well, complaining had, about? So that was that the background. Example. That was the background for the whole poorly Made in China, sorry, to, to quote a different book by uh, Paul Midler, Poorly Made in China, which is a very interesting book, by the yeah. way, really, really well written and entertaining. Poorly Made in China by Paul Midler, pick it up. Um, um, he, he, he talks about in there that you have all these products that are being poorly made, and Stanley Chow points out that they're poorly made just because of the background of the people who made them. And then you see this revolution take place where all of a sudden there's more, there's more income coming in. Uh, the, the, the Chinese start to come, uh, particularly urban IG, uh, Chinese, start to come from making almost no money to be in China middle class and upper middle class. They, the middle class and upper middle class is absolutely exploding in urban China. So now they've got money. So they don't want to buy cheap products any more than anybody else does. So this is part of one of the drivers for quality in China improving. And then as Jeff just pointed out, you've got it being mandated from the top saying, no, you're going to start making quality products because we got to improve this brand. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of where poor made in China came from and where, how we're morphing right now into good made in China uh, driven by uh, driven by the middle class and upper middle class, and driven by uh, the top, a mandate from the top. And Jeff, you think that's reflected in what you had heard from the, the, the Chinese delegates at, at ASQ that, that you, you saw earlier uh, in, in April? 
Yeah, it, with the exception of uh, the history of poverty, that that was really sort of absent. Uh, the Chinese very much presented themselves in the the modern 2018 status that their economy is, and they they um, sort of uh, noticeably did not include any of the history of of where they've come from. It's almost I'm I'm sort of a, a opining a little bit here, but it was almost as though that they didn't want that to be part of the discussion. We, here's where we are today, uh, and it doesn't matter where we came from, which, of course, as Henry Kissinger said, I, I put that, uh, uh, his analysis in the uh, article, you know, what they have done since the 1980s is truly an astonishing achievement. It's amazing. You know, when he first went there in the secret <laughs> visit in 1971, there were no skyscrapers, there were no automobiles, there were... Uh, everyone wore the same clothes, you know, it, the, it was just a, an amazing transformation in 20 years. And he even said, if if people would have told him that in 25 years you'd see these skyscrapers and these massive factories and all this, it, you know, he, he said he would have thought they were out of their mind to, to say that China would be that way in 25 years. But it's the Chinese very much present themselves uh, in a sort of first world sense today, uh, at least at the uh, summit we were at. Well, let's let's talk about this. But before we move on, let me just talk about this because I think it's important for both of you is is trend lines. I mean, if you extrapolate that trend line from 1980 until now, and you bring it forward into the next 20, 25 They're years. They're going to kick our butts. Well, that's, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, in my research, nobody is doubting that very, very quickly, China is going to surpass us um, in terms of quality of products. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in certain product areas, particularly high tech. I mean, they're, they're hitting, they're right on our heels right now in high tech. I mean, essentially, U.S. and uh, U.S. and China are essentially neck and neck in terms of quality of high tech mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're catching up on garments. Uh, they're, they're catching up across a lot of industries. Again, their middle. You got to remember the the middle class in in China is one of the. It is the largest retail market in the world. The largest retail market in the world. And that is who China is serving right now. So their manufacturers, they want a piece of that largest retail market in the world. In order to capture it, they have to make a good product. Mm. And they want to make a good product because they want that market just as much as all the foreigners want in that market. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that, Dirk, what you say is so true because, and it's amplified when you look at the numbers, and, and I'm I really surprised in my research how ignorant many Americans are, even some business people are, of the numbers involved. You know, uh, China has four times the population of the United States, and and uh, well over twice the population of the European Union, and that's 28 different countries. You know, China's population is is 10 times that of Russia. It's, it's Right now it's 1.4 billion people. So you start saying uh, the majority of those people are moving into the middle class, the upper middle class, you're talking about a gigantic market. Yeah, um, we should say the urban uh, uh, urban Chinese are, are going to that middle class. There's still a lot of poverty in China, there's still a lot of poor areas oh, in, of course. in there, but still, even just the urban Chinese is still, like you said, the largest largest retail market in the world. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they're <laughs> they're really, they're, they are really poised to take over, uh, particularly take over retail, and they're catching up on quality yeah. uh, in areas that you never would have. I mean, if you want to read something interesting, look at J.D. Power initial uh, initial product quality, initial uh, automobile quality, mm -hmm. China. Mm. They're like second and third. Mm. I mean, Chinese cars, cars you've never even heard of, are are matching uh, are matching head for head with the U.S. and Europeans and Japan and, 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 and Huawei. You, you, you oh yeah, example, then you yeah. then you can get high tech. You got Huawei uh, yeah. smartphones, yeah. which are like the leading or almost the leading. I think they're second now behind uh, third behind Apple and Samsung. Huawei is like right on the heels of, of Apple and Samsung in terms of the quality of their phones and their desirable phones, and they're not cheap. Yeah, and you, you, know, you, you say, you know, like, well, China's got, you know, still has a, an impoverished populace, which they do to a large measure, but yeah. half of 1% of 1.4 billion people is <laughs> millions and millions exactly. and millions of so consumers of to buy this stuff, to buy high-tech cars. And well, one thing I'm interested in, though, is that 
Okay, so you covered the history of China yes. uh, from uh, the beginning of time until now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, Sorry. You did. Yeah. Um, so the fact that China is able to do what they've done in almost 40 years, let's say from 1980s to now, almost 40 years, does, given their history, does it surprise you that they were able to ramp up that quickly? No. I mean, because when you do look at the history of China over the course of millennia, uh, you see that Chinese was a, the Chinese were a dominant, dominant power. I mean, America in the post-World War, World War II world pretty much just approximated the power that China had accumulated uh, during the Dark Ages in Europe um, and even before. When Rome was falling, um, China was already an ascendant power and they were ascendant for the next millennia. Um, there's compelling evidence that the Chinese actually discovered America, discovered the west coast of America in, in the in, you know, 50, 100 years before Columbus. Um, the, the Chinese power was such that there always was this cultural memory of dominance, of economic dominance, of, of societal dominance, of military dominance. So that was slumbering and you know the, the, the European nations that, that really dominated China in the, in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and into the 20th century, centuries, all knew it to a certain extent. They all talked about the sleeping giant, the, the, the latent power of the Chinese, of the Chinese culture. So I'm not surprised by it, and I don't think that the Chinese are surprised by it too. Jeff was saying that you know, the Chinese want to kind of obliterate this period of time where they were you know, the conquered instead of the conquering. Um, and that's understandable, but I think that they aren't at all hesitant to think back to the generations before that and look at what that they were, um, again, before they really slipped into um, more of a, they receded into more of a inward focus, uh, maybe like in the 16th century. They really had receded from the rest of the world, just as the Europeans were really dominating. Well, what, what I'm curious about, guys, is <laughs> maybe start with Jeff, is so a lot going on right now in the news in terms of uh, you know, trade tariffs and are we or aren't we and how much are we going to and which products and, and you know, the Chinese are, are piling on with that as, as well. How does all of that play out within the background of what we've just talked about, about, you know, the growing middle class, uh, large retail market, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, exponential increase in the quality of, of Chinese goods. How does all that fit into the whole trade thing that we're talking about right now? Well, I think that um, the uh, issue of, you know, we don't want to start a trade war. Let me start off being a little provocative. Uh, whenever some of my colleagues say, well, you don't want to start a trade war, my response is just purely looking at the economics of it. Well, what do you think we're in now? You know, I mean, with the, the, the issues that, I mean, it, it's everybody knows. And it was also an elephant in the room at the, at the Sino-U.S. summit in Seattle um, about the intellectual property infringement, the required transfer of, uh, of, uh, of uh, technology, the, uh, you have to have a Chinese partner. Uh, and there's many, many, many horror stories of American companies going there, taking the risk of trying to get into the gigantic Chinese market. Um, you know, you, you have to have Chinese partners. Uh, they learn, you, you've got to transfer their, your knowledge to them, and then they, uh, within a sometimes a matter of months, just go down the road and start their own company, and then they don't even need to deal with you, and they have all the contacts and so on to exploit the, their own native market. Um, and. And then, you know, and companies are left literally with nothing and they, they just evaporate. Uh, their technology's gone and the, the market opportunities are gone. So, uh, you know, there was, there's always that issue. And I think that the American side at the summit was very concerned about. Nobody really talked about it directly. Everyone talked about it indirectly, really from the standpoint of hoping that the Chinese were sufficiently developing their economy. They recognized that they would have to play fair. They spoke uh, many times in platitudes about wanting to protect intellectual property. Um, and one speaker said it very well. He said, let me say something about intellectual property protection. The Chinese, we Chinese people are uh, and our companies are developing a lot of our own intellectual property, and that needs to be protected. So it's not just about protecting 
uh, of you know the West's IP. It's also as we emerge and invent and innovate and do all kinds of things, we own the patents and the the ideas and the concepts, and we want that protected as well because we know that in an out and out trade war, uh, it things to get very nasty with regard to IP theft on both sides. Yeah, and, and another thing was this idea that that the ZTE company that we we all in some way, shape, or form mentioned. I yeah. certainly mentioned it in my piece as well. Um, ZTE, so, is, is, ZTE is, a, is a telecommunications telecommunic company. And they, they were, a lot of their, their uh, raw material uh, and components came from United comes, US Comes US from the US, yeah. and, and the US, because there was this, and I think it's, it's, it's well established that there was a link that uh, China was, was sharing, ZTE was, was selling technology to uh, Iran. Right. So the American uh, Congress uh, took actions to prevent that from happening, and ZTE is pretty much on a on uh, kind of on a death watch right now, and all the Trump lately has come out and said that he wants to try to help them out if he can to save Chinese jobs. Imagine that. Well, except that, <laughs> except there is the flip side to that is if if the companies here in the United States can't sell to ZTE, it's also impacting well, there, American there, jobs. There, and there's another flip side to it too that even goes beyond that is that is that you know in a trade war you know you want to have some leverage and and if you are forcing a company like ZTE and forcing the Chinese government to form their own component shop to supply ZTE and others across the world then what's going to happen to the American companies that rely on that business? Which, which by the way, is what Made in China 2025 is, is very, about. It, that, it's that's rather what, predatory. It's, it's rather... Well, it's like, yeah. no, we want to make our own stuff and be our own suppliers. But, but also be a, a, a net exporter of a lot of this stuff, too. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. want to sell it all over the world if they can. Yeah. And the markets are there. I mean, uh, Jeff, you, you know, we, we know this when we look at, at the world economy that, you know, it's not just China. Um, you know, all over the world, and, and you, know, you can speak this, you spend a lot of time in Africa. I mean, I mean, the Chinese are making a huge play in Africa right now. They look at it as a as a market that has some real potential for them. Oh, absolutely! And you know, they, they look at it as a supply base for raw materials, uh, and of course, connecting up Africa all the way through um, the Middle East with the Belt and Road Initiative, and then, but also as Africa is developing in many places, that represents. A, a tremendous opportunity, and many people have said that the Chinese, or the Chinese, uh, very much view Africa as sort of their future export territory, uh, and they just put their uh, first military, their first overseas military base on the Horn of Africa. All right. Well, last word time, guys. So we have a couple minutes here. So, so uh, Dirk, your takeaway on this, on on the series that we've done, and your piece in particular. What what's the message that you think is the most important thing that you, you want to communicate? Well, to you? Actually, it's 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 in the headline of my stories. I have my, my headline is "Made in China: From Scary Bad to <laughs> Scary Good." Scary. It, it's sc <laughs> well, scary bad because initially, I mean, you know, I mean, you, she was, you just go back eight years to 2000, or 10 years to 2008, the, the tainted milk scandal. I mean, where Chinese quality wasn't just stuff necessarily falling apart in your hand, it was really, even domestically in China, it was killing people, yeah. right? So scary bad, but now they've advanced so quickly, particularly in the tech areas, that it's gotten to the point where it's scary good for those people who are competing against them because now, you know, when we competed against Japan, which is a tiny little country, uh, we got our butts kicked. Mm -hmm. And now we're competing against Japan, who is, China. I'm yeah. China, who yeah. is gargantuan. I'm going, this doesn't look real rosy to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What yeah, about you, I mean, Jeff? China's What's 11 you? times the size of uh, Japan, and their economy is about three times the size of Japan's. It's incredible. Yep. So, Jeff, what's your what's your final takeaway on this in in terms of the piece the pieces that we've done? You've read them all now. Um, you know, what do you think about what we're presenting and, and your piece of it and what you saw when you went up to the the ASQ event? I think that as it sets into the popular um, press, the numbers and the progress and the size and the scale of the uh, the Chinese economy and the Chinese capabilities. And you know when you, you look at the initiative of China made in China 2025. I mean, we're talking about seven years. You know, that's nothing. And uh, you know, and, and where they've come just in the last, as you said, you know, 30, 40 years. So it, I think, increasingly, it's going to scare the the Dickens out of a lot of people. The some of the uh, interviews that I did, there were clearly executives that were Western executives that were 
uh, not just rattled, but alarmed at what this represents because of the size of the scale. Um, so it it is uh, going to be an interesting uh, road. I think in many ways, uh, anybody who's complacent in the West, particularly in high technology, it's going to make, uh, you know, it's going to spur innovation in many ways, as people will use in the same way that they use Japan as the existential threat back in the 1980s, and that sparked this sort of quality revolution that we experienced. I think we'll have other revolutions that will positively impact, um, you know, companies and therefore, of course, their customers. Um, but at a larger level, um, you know, there is talk about the uh, United States, along with Japan, along with uh, Western Europe, uh, or the European Union, rather, uh, cooperating much more not so much to contain China, but to protect vested interests in industries that are well established in the West. Yeah. Good, good and what about you? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, looking again historically as my perspective on this, I think that we can, we can learn a lot from the past. And I think that, you know, as Santayana said, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. I mean, we have made mistakes in this country, certainly when dealing with, China, with uh, Japan mm -hmm. um, in the post-World World War world and I think that you know the lessons that we're trying to convey I think in looking at this series try to maybe help us understand where we're at and, and where we've come from and where we're going and there are some really big issues uh, we're, we're pretty excited about what we've reported on what we found out and we we hope you're all going to like it as well. So check should, it out. It's going to go ahead, Drick. I, I, should, I should mention, uh, aside from articles from yes. uh, Jeff and Mike and I, uh, we also have two other contributors. Uh, Laurel Tennis did a nice little write-up on Made in China uh, 2025, that mm -hmm. program, kind of a synopsis of what it covers. And Ryan Day um, had a really interesting article where he interviewed a bunch of um, American uh uh, small business uh, owners and operators and shop floor people to get their perspective on what uh, these companies all uh, dealt with China uh, and trade, either uh, selling to China mm -hmm. or getting uh, materials from China, and what their experience was uh, is like dealing with China. And uh, you might be surprised at some of the quotes. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So it take is. a look at both yeah. of those articles yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah, they're 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 yeah. coming out. Yeah, we, we really hope you'll you'll check it all out. The U U.S. China relationship in, in there's a link. Uh, there's a link to the yes, first article of the series underneath the player page there, so you can click that, and that'll take you to the beginning of the entire series. The whole thing. So check it out. Thanks again for all of you for listening. Listening in, Jeff Dewar, CEO of, of Quality Digest, Dirk Ducharme, of course, our editor in chief. Thanks for joining us as well. We'll see you guys later. So, and there you are. And if you're interested in learning more about this timely topic, you can read the articles in the series by using the link on this player page. That'll take you out to one of the articles. And while you're on that page, you'll see some navigation on the right hand side that will actually link to all of the articles in that series. It was a good series. I think I, I had a fun time reading all the articles that, that you wrote. Yeah, and, yeah, no, that and, was, and Jeff some wrote good and the rest stuff. of our team. Really, really interesting. I learned a lot about that, so hopefully you yeah. guys will enjoy it too. All right, well, that's going to do it for our show this week. But before we go, we want to let you know that we're hosting a webinar next week. Statistical Indices 101, what they are and how to communicate them is the webinar. And it's being presented by Matt Savage and Eric Gasper of PQ Systems. Dirk, as usual, is gonna be your host. Uh, and the event occurs on Tuesday, June 5th, as you can see right there, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So keep your eye on your email inbox for information on how you can register if you haven't done so already. So, That's it, and uh, that is it for today's show. You all have a good weekend, and we will see you next Friday. See you next week. So long, bye.